Dr. Bolin back here with you for another session of Microbiology Boot Camp. Our topic today is going to be the infamous Listeria monocytogenes. Now this one is uh, not something that really causes unique diseases. You know, unlike Bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax, or Clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus, this one causes, for the most part, foodborne illness and meningitis. Uh, so those things have much more common causes, but why this is important is because this causes those things in vulnerable patients. And so when it comes to choosing a treatment regimen for those patients, you need to keep listeria in mind. And so that's why it's important and that's why it is testable. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. I have the link here, hyperlink below. You can click on the I button on the upper right hand corner. If you consider a voluntary contribution of a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help offset the cost of these videos. Um, also, feel free to patronize my advertisers or just uh, subscribe to my page. Um, you'll get alerts and updates as I post more and more videos. So thank you very much in advance. This is uh, the gram-positive versus gram-negative cell wall, you should be intimately familiar with this because this is all very highly testable. Uh, I, I have a video up on the overview for gram-positives where I talk about all of these things from the gram-positive side, so I would recommend going back there and watching that, as well as what the gram stain means and why it's important, because that is also testable. All right, we're going to work through our algorithm here. We're also going to talk about some of the characteristics of Listeria, some pretty unique things going on with this one. We'll talk about the diseases, and then we'll finish up with a story. So here's our algorithm here. We're talking about gram-positive bacilli. Now note that I put aerobic. You might want to cross that out because technically all of these are obligate or are facultative anaerobes. Um, but I put aerobic here because they can grow in aerobic conditions unlike Clostridium, which is the other genus of gram-positive bacilli. So these are obligate anaerobes, but they can and do grow in aerobic conditions, and I really just wanted to draw your attention to that. So we've got three genuses that we're going to be uh, talking about as far as these obligate anaerobic gram-positive rods and Listeria will be the first one. I put all of the most important information that you need to know on this algorithm here. So it is a gram-positive bacillus. It is facultatively anaerobic. It is modal. It does indeed have a flagellum. Uh, and then this is classically described as tumbling motility, and I'll show you a, a video of that uh, on the next slide. This is big here. It can grow in cold conditions, 4 to 10 degrees Celsius. That's roughly the temperature you keep your refrigerator at, and for that reason, this commonly grows in unpasteurized milk that you keep in the fridge, and also in deli meats, which are refrigerated. So you can do all, you know, check all your, uh, your boxes as far as food safety, and you can still wind up with listeria. Uh, so for that reason, this is a common one that gets recalled as far as, like, meats and, in particular, fruits. It lives in the GI tract, so if you're fertilizing a field with animal manure and it happens to have listeria in it or it's not tended to properly, uh, you'll get recalls, things like melons and lettuce and stuff like that. And then this is another one here that's really big. It's facultatively intracellular, and we'll talk about uh, how that happens in a little bit. This is what it looks like under the microscope. Notice the flagellum here. The flagellum are uh, inactivated as it gets warmer. So in particular when it gets inside the body. But this is, uh, this is how it uh, stays modal uh, in vitro, if you will, outside the body. So as I said, it's got what's characteristically described as a tumbling motility. Now you'll see this under the microscope because it's cold enough. Uh, but this is not how it's modal inside the body. So it has a different way of being modal when it's inside the body. Now when it gets inside the body, so uh, here we're talking about cells, it enters the cell, it's inside a phagosome, 
and then it uses a virulence factor slash toxin called Listeria lysin O. And Listeria lysin O breaks down the phagosome, so it evades intracellular lysis. Uh, and then once it gets into the cell, into the cytosol, it will polymerize host actin, and by doing that, it becomes motile. So this is called actin-based motility, and this actin that's on the bacteria is often described as rocket tails. So it's not using the flagellum inside the bacteria, it's using actin. So make sure and keep that in mind, that it's got two ways of being motile, but when it's inside the cell, it uses actin. And another thing that this can do is it can go from cell to cell. So by going from cell to cell, instead of having to go outside the cell every time it wants to evade, invade another one, it can avoid a, the humoral immunity, namely uh, antibodies. Uh, and so that's another virulence factor here. All right, so we talked about all of these things that can grow in the cold and refrigerated foods, deli meats, raw milk, fresh cheeses. It's got flagellum, which causes it to have a tumbling motility. And then it can polymerize actin inside the cell. And it can use that to facilitate cell-to-cell -cell movement, which helps it avoid antibodies. And we talked about Listeria lysin O, destroys the phagosome, prevents intracellular killing. Here's a little cartoon you might be interested in. I put it on here. Uh, notice it says at 37 degrees it moves like a rocket. It uses the actin-based rocket tails. The diseases that it causes, gastroenteritis occurs in uh, immunocompetent and immunocompromised alike. So it does cause gastroenteritis, but it's a little different from your run-of-the-mill staph aureus or C. perfringens or uh, bacillus cereus gastroenteritis in that it's got a very delayed onset. So we're talking here median onset incubation period of about three weeks. So you might eat deli meat or something and then three weeks later, you're starting to get diarrhea and nausea and vomiting and stuff like that. In addition to that, though, it also causes flu-like symptoms. So we're talking a headache and a fever and maybe some night sweats and myalgias and headache. And so flu-like symptoms. And that's pretty unique to listeria gastroenteritis. So like I said, this occurs in anyone. Now, meningitis from listeria only occurs in vulnerable patients. So here we're talking about immunocompromised people, alcoholics, and then the extremes of age. So under three months and over the age of 50, but in particular, the very elderly. And again, your symptoms here, are they're going to be the same as all your other meningitis. Uh, so uh, it's it does, obviously, it's a bacterial meningitis. So if you get your lumbar puncture and do a CSF analysis, you're going to see high white cells and, and low glucose and everything you'd expect. You're not going to be able to diagnose listeria on culture because it takes a long time for listeria to grow on culture. So we're not concerned about culture here. You really just need to treat this empirically. So when you're dealing with meningitis in a baby, or you're dealing with it in a, an older person or an immunocompromised person, you're going to change your treatment regimen uh, accordingly to cover listeria. Some other things it causes, it can cause spontaneous abortion in pregnant women. For that reason, we tell them to avoid uh, deli meats and raw milk. Uh, it can also occur in cheeses, in like the fresh cheeses like queso fresco. It can be, it can cause amnionitis, which often causes spontaneous abortion, but it can be transmitted from mom to baby, and then the baby develops meningitis, so kind of a congenital meningitis. It can also cause granulomatosis and phantaseptica, not relevant for boards, and then it can cause sepsis as well. The treatment is ampicillin. So ampicillin is going to be tacked on to your typical treatment for meningitis when you're dealing with immunocompromised, very old, very young. And then sometimes you'll see ampicillin and gentamicin together. That's fine too. These two are synergistic uh, together. But you can just use ampicillin alone. That's fine. It's active against listeria. So notice here we've got our different uh, treatments for bacterial meningitis based on age. And this is really important to know, especially as you get towards step two and three. Uh, you've got a patient, you know they've got bacterial meningitis, you don't want to wait for a culture. So if you know they've got bacterial meningitis, we just treat them empirically. Now, you go through this, you think, oh, that's a lot to memorize. Well, not really. So everyone with meningitis, we do a third-generation cephalosporin, and then uh, 
vancomycin. Uh, now, when you're dealing with the very, very young, under three months, and older people, we tack on ampicillin. And so with that, then, you've got your, your treatment regimen. So in neonates, use a third generation plus ampicillin, uh, or you can use just ampgent is fine, too. All right. Our story takes place in the cold, white north. And I put a cold scene for this bacteria because, well, listeria grows in the cold. And that's something you need to remember. About 4 to 10 degrees Celsius. Now, 4 to 10 degrees Celsius is probably a little warmer than when you get snow. But if you remember that it grows in the cold, that's, that's pretty good to know for your step. Okay, here comes our snake friend, and he's got a cute little hat on. But this purple snake is our recurring symbol for gram-positive rods. And he doesn't have a mask, and he doesn't have a mask because it is not an obligate anaerobe. It is a facultative anaerobe. It certainly does grow in aerobic conditions. And to reflect that, I put this cloud blowing air. So it can grow in aerobic conditions. Listeria can grow in aerobic conditions. Now notice our little sick kid here has a cat friend, and the cat friend is there to remind you that this is a catalase positive organism. Now that's not a super important aspect of listeria, but it is important when you're talking about immunodeficiency. So chronic granulomatous disease, for instance, makes you susceptible to catalase positive organisms. So I added that in here for good measure. Now this little kid is doing what kids like to do in the cold, and that is doing cartwheels in the, maybe not everyone, but he's having fun out there and he's twirling around because listeria has tumbling motility. So this little kid tumbling reminds you that listeria has tumbling motility. And then here comes Dr. Lister the Eskimo. Now the real Dr. Lister wasn't an Eskimo, he was a British person. Uh, but I put the Eskimo here because I don't think it snows that much in in Britain. So this is Dr. Lister the Eskimo. List Doctor the real Dr. Lister was the namesake of Listeria. He was a, a pioneer. Joseph Lister was a pioneer in antiseptic surgery. Now Dr. Lister is an old man, and that's to remind you that Listeria, in particular, uh, Listeria meningitis, occurs in people among others that are very old. And he's also carrying a bottle of Listerine, also named for Joseph Lister. And that's to remind you that uh, this is not only Listerine, this is Listerine Zero or Listerine O. Uh, that's to remind you of the, uh, the virulence factor Listeria Lysin O, which helps break down phagosomes and promotes intracellular survival. Now here comes his little assistant, uh, this little girl here, and she is a child. Not quite the age where you get listeria meningitis, but reminds you that the very, very young can get listeria meningitis. We're talking infants under three months. And she's carrying raw milk and deli meats for lunch. Probably not some, something you'd want to give somebody with listeria, uh, but it is something that can cause listeria, in particular listeria gastroenteritis. So raw milk for unpasteurized milk and these cold cuts here for deli meats. Now here comes the little boy's mom. And the mom is pregnant and has a baby. Pregnant women with a sick baby. To remind you that it can be passed to a fetus. It can also cause spontaneous abortion and granulomatosis infantaseptica. This little kid here is sick, and sick reminds you of immunocompromised patients. Now, I could have put a bottle of whiskey next to him, but that's not appropriate for little kids. But that would remind you that listeria meningitis can also happen in patients who are alcoholics. Notice the head compress here. That's to remind you that listeria causes meningitis or meningoencephalitis. Now over these igloos is a roof that kind of looks like an intestine. And that will remind you that listeria causes gastroenteritis in anyone. 
Remember, that's the delayed onset gastroenteritis, often with flu-like symptoms that occurs approximately three weeks after eating the contaminated food. Oh, here we got this little husky here. I have a German Shepherd, so I really like huskies because they're pretty similar. And the husky is poking his way out of one igloo and fixing to go into another. And that reminds you that not only is this facultatively intracellular, but it can move from cell to cell via those actin rockets. And they are being entertained by the music coming from this amp, which reminds you that the treatment for listeria meningitis is ampicillin in addition to your general regimen, your empiric regimen uh, for uh, for meningitis. So remember a third generation cephalosporin plus vancomycin uh, plus ampicillin. You don't need to use vancomycin in children uh, or in infants rather, uh, but you will use ampicillin along with, uh, with gentamicin for, for infants.